Good evening. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami. Tonight we have another in the ongoing series of uh, Google Hangouts educational Parkinson, Parkinsonism education with world-renowned neural, uh, Parkinsonism educator Dr. Abdul Rana. Uh, and tonight Dr. Rana is going to be talking about cogn cognitive dysfunction in Parkinsonism. Good evening, Dr. Rana. Good evening, Dr. Bennett. Okay, well, I'll start right off with a question. Sure. What, are the, what are the features of cognitive dysfunction in Parkinsonism? Patients with Parkinson's disease initially may have only very mild cognitive deficits. They may have just uh, trouble with uh, impaired planning, uh, organization of goal-directed activity, a difficulty with set shifting, and visuospatial problems, as well as perceptual issues. They might, find, uh, they might find difficulty problem solving, learning, and memory. But as the disease progresses, about half of the patients would meet the criteria of dementia during the course of Parkinson's disease. And as they develop evident dementia, uh, their condition would further deteriorate. They would become more disabled, and sometimes they may need long-term care placement. These patients, when they develop dementia, they, they have slowness, they have apathy, they have bradyphidemia, and they have fluctuation in the attention and cognition, and they have mood and personality issues. Sometimes they could have hallucinations as well as psychosis. Their recall is affected, uh, but, as, uh, uh, but in contrast to Alzheimer's disease, uh, their language remains intact uh, till late in the course of disease. So in the beginning, they may have just slow thinking. They may uh, need more time to respond to questions. But, uh, uh, but if the memory and cognitive issues occur in the beginning of Parkinson's disease, then the diagnosis may be questionable. So these patients in the beginning, they perform poorly on visual, spatial, and perceptual, and perceptual testing. But otherwise, their language and praxis remains intact. They have only mild memory problems. Their recall may be uh, just slightly impaired. But as the disease progresses, uh, these things also get involved. The cognitive and behavioral issues, uh, they may be more disabling uh, than, uh, than the motor symptoms of these patients. And the family may notice changes in their mood and personality as the time goes by. So uh, these patients have certain risk factors to develop the dementia, uh, such as old age, uh, more uh, the severe motor disorder, if they have depression, or if they have family history of dementia and psychosis as well. So these uh, factors will lead them to develop the dementia much earlier than, uh, than a person who does not have these risk factors. So when you uh, see these patients, they uh, not only have cognitive issues, but they have behavioral manifestations as well. They will have severely impaired executive dysfunction, visual, spatial, attention, and, and fluctuation problems, uh, as well as they could have dysthymia, apathy, abulia, anhedonia, social withdrawal, and this may lead to depression. Some patients have visual hallucinations. However, the delusions and paranoia and auditory hallucinations are less common in these patients overall. Very good. Uh, how should a patient be assessed that has cognitive dysfunction? The most important thing in assessment of these patients is parallel history. So history from the history from the caregiver who may be spouse or a child or a family member. So history plays a major role. So when you take history of these patients and uh, review their medical history as well, so reviewing all the medications which may be contributing, such as anticholinergic medications, or sometimes uh, some of the medications such as uh, uh, sleeping medications or uh, the, these type of sedatives are used. So they may, uh, they, may, um, they may affect the memory as well. So ruling out a, a, a acute confusional states such as delirium, uh, some patients may have UTI or pneumonia, and they could uh, develop delirious state and may look uh, like dementia. Sometimes patients may have coexistence depression, and because of depression, they may be thought uh, that their memory is not, uh, not up to the part. And sometimes these patients may have other conditions, uh, such as vascular dementia or Alzheimer's or frontotemporal issues. Uh, patients with uh, 
normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is usually a triad of incontinence, uh, mild cognitive dysfunction, and gait problems, they may look like uh, dementia or Parkinson's disease. And sometimes focal modulation such as tumors uh, or frontal lobe meningioma, uh, they can also be presenting as a dementing condition. Other causes such as reversible uh, things, uh, B12 deficiency, thyroid issues, renal or hepatic dysfunction, neurosyphilis, hypercalcemia, or any other metabolic or general medical conditions, uh, they should be ruled out as well. Once these things are ruled out, and most of these things can be ruled out based on history, and the parallel history is obtained, then, uh, then the physician can move on to uh, formal cognitive testing which can be done based upon, the, uh, based upon the background of the patient. Suppose if the patient is less educated or, um, or they, they have been working in a relatively uh, less, uh, less cognitive demonic uh, job. Uh, so, uh, uh, so looking at all the factors, you can uh, use mini mental status examination. In some patients, you can use MOCA as well. So, uh, so these are mostly uh, scales which are used, uh, but they are more uh, of a guidance from uh, visit to visit. They help you to, uh, to follow the progress of these patients, but uh, most of the information comes from the history of these patients. Okay, what are the treatments of cognitive dysfunctions in, uh, in Parkinsonism? So when uh, these patients are seen, the first thing, if they have only mild issues, then some of these strategies may be all that may be needed, uh, such, as, uh, uh, such as counseling these patients to slow down when they're making a decision or giving themselves enough time, avoiding stressful situations, repeating things which they need to remember. Uh, they should repeat the same thing uh, uh, several times. And when they are trying to recall, they should try to relax. And sometimes uh, writing down uh, these things or relating these things to an image uh, or making a list of things or keeping a calendar and planning these things might be helpful. Uh, also, uh, these patients uh, uh, could be started on medication if uh, the cognitive dysfunction is significant. and. Uh, uh, main cholinesterase inhibitor used in these patients is rivastigmine. <clears throat> rivastigmine is usually started at a dose of 1.5 milligram once a day, and then after a few weeks' time, you can move the dose higher to a uh, to 1.5 milligram twice a day, and this can be gradually increased. Now, this is available in patch form as well, so the patients can be started in the patch number five, and then slowly this can be increased to patch number ten. The other uh, cholinesterase inhibitors, such as galentamine and dunpazil, uh, dunpazil uh, are also helpful. Uh, however, the evidence is more in favor of rivastigmine. Uh, so uh, the rivastigmine uh, helps patients to increase their cholinergic effect, and it blocks the hydrolysis of acetylcholine by blocking the cholinesterase. And the support for rivastigmine comes from the EXPRESS study, which was a prospective randomized multi-center study. Uh, and these patients were assessed for a 24 week uh, of duration. About 400 patients were enrolled. And uh, um, uh, these patients had dementia for about, uh, these patients uh, had dementia, but their Parkinson's disease was at least more than two years uh, uh, diagnosed before the onset of dementia. So these patients, uh, uh, when they were uh, treated uh, on, ex, um, on, on um, rivastigmine versus placebo, they did, uh, uh, they did clinically as well as statistically significantly better uh, with Exilon. And, and, and Exilon also uh, helps uh, to control the hallucinations of these patients as well. These, uh, the main side effects uh, are nausea and vomiting. Sometimes there could be slight worsening of tremor but uh, which is usually not a, uh, which was not a cause of withdrawal from this, uh, uh, from this study. Very good, very good. Uh, what percentage, Doc, does, do, cog do all Parkinsonism patients have cognitive dysfunctions? Uh, 
at some uh, at some level. Now, eventually, most patients would develop cognitive dysfunction, but in the moderate stage, moderate to advanced stage of Parkinson's disease, about half of the patients would have some degree of cognitive dysfunction. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, anything else to add before we wrap it up for cognitive dysfunction for Parkinson Parkinsonism? Uh, screening of these patients is uh, very important because patients uh, may not report their memory issues or other cognitive issues. Uh, so the physician has to take a lead to ask these questions uh, to the family members. They might just uh, uh, they might just attribute these to old age or say that well they just misplace things uh, you know once in a while. But once you go into details, you will find out that. Uh, these patients have significant cognitive issues. So once the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is made, then on um, on, on serial follow-up visits, these patients should should be uh, should be screened regularly. Very good, doctor. Thank you for coming out tonight. As usual, a very very fine uh, lecture. Um, and come come tomorrow night at 9:30 at more Parkinson Parkinsonism TV for another in a series of Parkinsonism educational. Hangouts. Uh, good evening, Dr. Rana. Thank you. Good evening.